Last week we read an earlier passage where Savitri, struggling with her grief at the foreknowledge that Satyavan must die, receives a summon from her, from her highest self. A voice comes and tells her, why are you just uh, not doing anything? You're just um, wallowing in your grief here. You must um, arise, O soul, and vanquish time and death. And at first there's some resistance in the human heart. It says, oh, my, my strength has been taken from me, and surely I should just accept my fate. But then the voice tells her, then I would have to return and say that you're leaving your mission undone. And then something deep in her answers and says, Command, for I am here to do thy will. And then there's this wonderful passage where the voice tells her what she has to do. She has to remember why thou camest, find out thy soul, recover thy hid self, in silence seek God's meaning in thy depths, <coughs> then mortal nature change to the divine. This is Shrobindo's program. No? This is the program that mother has uh, given to us here for Oroville. She says the first thing to do is to find out who you really are. And then you will find out that in the center of your being there's that one who knows what you have to do. And if you make that, it wants to become the acting dynamic center of your life in Oroville. If, if you have that contact, then you will know how to become a true Aurevillian. Mm -hmm. So it's the same message, what is given to Savitri, it is given to all of us. Remember why you came, why is your soul here in this body at this time? Find out thy soul. And we shall see in the next Cantos, how Savitri goes about finding her soul and recovering her hid, hidden self. That has to be done first. Then it becomes possible to change the mortal nature, the human nature, into the divine nature. We can't do that. That has to be done by the divine. And it can only be done when there's an opening in the psychic being. But before she starts on that process, now when she's accepted that mission and uh, she looks into herself and starts seeking for her soul, the first thing that happens is this dream, a dream disclosed to her the cosmic past, the whole past of the universe. And I remember that in one of her talks the mother says, when you first have a contact with your soul, that's when you might get a memory of all the soul experiences from the past. So something like that happens to Savitri. Hmm? She sees um, the shadowy beginnings of world fate you know, and how creation took its first mysterious steps and how bodies can become vessels of soul. You know. So what we are reading now is Savitri is seeing that 
on the nature level, the appearances, everything is the action of a blind world energy. That world energy, that nature energy is driving evolution forward. It's creating all these forms, doing everything that we call nature. But she is unconscious, unconscious of her own exploits she worked, shaping a universe out of the inane, the emptiness and meaninglessness. And then that world energy begins to become a little bit conscious in small individual beings, in small individual plants and animals, there's a consciousness. Even in very, very small things, even we had a gentleman here once who was a physicist and he said even in the atom there's some consciousness, some choice happens. The physicist can observe that. Of course, he was a student of Sri Aurobindo, so that's how he interpreted it. The physicists don't. But um, that divine consciousness is everywhere. But it's involved in the appearances of matter. So the little atom, it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have senses, and yet some kind of awareness is there. So this is that blind world energy beginning to wake up and it gathers around the pinpoint head, the tiny little speck of the ego that consciousness organizes itself around that. And then a sentient creature, a creature that can sense things, can relate to its environment in a more or less conscient way. That being can move and live a breathing, thinking whole. That's where we stopped last time. Hmm? So I'm going to read on from there. On a dim ocean of subconscious life, a formless surface consciousness awoke. A stream of thoughts and feelings came and went. A foam of memories hardened and became a bright crust of habitual sense and thought, a seat of living personality. And recurrent habits mimicked permanence. Mind, nascent, labored out a mutable form. It built a mobile house on shifting sands, a floating isle upon a bottomless sea. A conscious being was by this labor made. It looked around it on its difficult field in the green, wonderful and perilous earth. It hoped in a brief body to survive, relying on matter's false eternity. It felt a godhead in its fragile house. It saw blue heavens, dreamed immortality. conscious soul in the inconscious world, hidden behind our thoughts and hopes and dreams. 
an indifferent master signing nature's acts leaves the vicegerent mind a seeming king. In his floating house upon the sea of time, the regent sits at work and never rests. He is a puppet of the dance of time. He is driven by the hours. The moment's call compels him with the thronging of life's need and the babel of the voices of the world. This mind no silence knows nor dreamless sleep. In the incessant circling of its steps, thoughts tread forever through the listening brain. It toils like a machine and cannot stop. Into the body's many storied rooms, Endless crowd down the dream God's messages. All is a hundred toned murmur and babble and stir. There is a tireless running to and fro, a haste of movement and a ceaseless cry. The hurried servant senses answer a pace to every knock upon the outer doors. Bring, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, bring in time's visitors, report each call, admit the thousand queries and the calls and the messages of communicating minds and the heavy business of unnumbered lives and all the thousandfold commerce of the world. Even in the tracts of sleep is scant repose. He mocks life steps in strange subconscious dreams. He strays in a subtle realm of symbol scenes. His night with thin air visions and dim forms he packs, or peoples with slight drifting shapes and only a moment spends in silent self. So we'll go back to line 136 and we'll look at each sentence. You're going to start, Rosa? Yes? <clears throat> On a dim ocean of um, subconscious life, a formless surface consciousness evoke. A stream of thoughts and feelings came and went. A form of memories and became a bright crust of habitual sense and thoughts. A seed of living personality and recurrent habits mimicked permanently. <coughs> Good, yeah. So this is what is being shown to 
Savitri. Hmm? She needs to know all this. <coughs> so she sees how in the evolutionary process it seems to start out as we emerge from matter as if there's an ocean, a vast ocean of life, subconscious life, life that is not conscious. Hmm? But in that dim ocean of subconscious life, a formless surface consciousness awoke. And first of all, it's just like a stream of thoughts, feelings. We were reading about this in the Life Divine last night. No? A stream of thoughts and feelings came and went. And even there's something like they are connected, these thoughts and feelings, so that there's something like memory also. And that memories, they come together and it's like a skin, it becomes a skin or a crust, a, c a hardened covering, a bright crust of habitual sense and thought. If you leave milk, boiled milk, and it uh, becomes cool, then you get a kind of skin on the top. If that happens with mud in the rainy season, no? the mud becomes uh, <laughs> slippery. <coughs> but as it dries out, you get a, a hard layer on top, a crust. So that with that ocean of subconscious life, subconscious life, something like that, something's forming on the surface, which is more cohesive, which holds together more, and that's the beginning of the development of uh, conscious being. It becomes that crust of habitual sense, the things that we do over and over again by habit. It becomes a seat of a living personality because everybody's crust is different. Mm. Yeah. And we have these habits, or nature has habits, things that she does over and over and over again. And when she's in those habits, they are established, it's as if those things are permanent, as if they have always been and always will be. But Sri Aurobindo always points out to us that these so-called laws of nature are only habits. <coughs> and if they are habits, they can be changed. Hmm? <coughs> Anybody wants to ask anything about this? Is the <laughs> yes. So they, they be, a mimic is somebody who pretends to be something that he isn't. So these are habits, but they um, pretend that they are permanent, that they are fixed, that they will, that, that will always be like that. Mind, nascent, labeled out in beautiful form. It builds a mobile house on shifting sands, a floating isle upon a bottomless sea. Mm -hmm. So that somehow that crust and formation of habits allows mind to begin to emerge. Nascent means being born, getting born. <coughs> So that emerging mind labors out, it creates by its effort a form. Before it was just a stream, no? now it's a form. But it's a mutable form. The forms that mind makes are changeable. They are not fixed like the forms that matter makes. It built a mobile house 
on shifting stands. So usually when we think of a house, well, it has to be something firm and fixed. But you can have a mobile house. And if your house is built on sand, if it doesn't have a firm foundation, definitely it will move. You know? Because those sands don't give it a firm base. They are shifting. And sometimes sand shifts a lot. Or oh, a floating isle upon a bottomless sea. This happens sometimes. Of course, we think about islands, that they are fixed to the bottom of the sea. But if the sea hasn't got any bottom, then the island <coughs> floats. And there are uh, places where that happens, where our vegetation comes together, it creates a kind of mass and seeds come, and even animals and birds come and live on that island but it's not fixed to anything. It's floating on that ocean of subconsciousness. Hmm? So the Mumbai folks should not take it literally, it's something figurative. These are images, yes. Yeah. <coughs> Powerful images to help us uh, conceptualize, form an idea of things that uh, are difficult for us. No? <coughs> so when Savitri is having this dream, this vision, she sees and understands all these things. Sri Aurobindo is trying to help us to understand them through these images. No? Yes, would you read on line 146? Yes, thank you. So out of this labor of mind, creating a floating isle on this bottomless sea of subconscious life, an individual conscious being was made, was created. Not just one, actually many. This conscious being, we can say, is the human being. Mm -hmm. So the human being wakes up and looks around at its field, the environment in which it lives, and it becomes aware of all the challenges. Mm -hmm. And it's a difficult field on this green and wonderful and perilous earth, this dangerous earth. Sri Aurobindo is often telling us how beautiful the earth is, but also how dangerous it is. Mm. So when that conscious being becomes self-aware of itself in its environment, there's in it the hope to persist, to survive. And to start with, it relies on matter on these material things that are around it. And he speaks of matter's false eternity. It's one of the basic laws of physics, no? that matter can neither be created nor destroyed. So there is something permanent about matter. It may change its forms, but the basic underlying matter changes. But because it's moving, because it's a, a mobile house on shifting sands, all the forms change. So in that way, matter doesn't give us permanence. But that conscious being, it's hoping to survive, and it even becomes aware, it senses somehow not very clearly, but it senses that there is a divine 
presence in its fragile house. The fragile house is our body. Shobindo refers to the body as our house because our soul lives inside it. No? So this conscious being which has been created by mind, it's a mental being, somehow becomes aware of something divine and uh, even immortal in this fragile house which is going to break, which is not going to last very long. No? And so it looks up and it sees the skies and it thinks of heavens, beautiful blue heavens that are uh, more peaceful and more harmonious than our earth and it dreams of the possibility of immortality. Hmm? So this is a very brief and concise summary of the whole process of evolution up to now. Hmm? And in what comes next, um, <coughs> Sri Aurobindo is going to speak particularly about the mind, the kind of mind that we have. Hmm? Lela, you will read. A conscious soul in the inconscient world, hidden behind our thoughts and hope and dreams, an indifferent <coughs> master, signing nature's <coughs> act, leaves the vice germant mind a seeming dream. Hmm. So none of that would be possible if there weren't in this inconscient world of matter, if there weren't dwelling within it a conscious soul. And that conscious soul doesn't only dwell within the universe as a whole, it dwells in every single particle and part and form of this universe. So, but to us, when we live in our minds, that conscious soul is hidden. It's hidden and veiled by our thoughts and our hopes and our dreams. And it seems that for a long time the soul doesn't actually care. Here he describes it as an indifferent master. The soul is actually the owner of the house and he should be telling it what to do. No? But he doesn't do that. For a long time he doesn't do that. He just allows nature to do whatever she wants. So he's the master, he has to sign, but he just signs everything that she puts in front of him. Hmm? Signing nature's acts. Hmm? So that leaves the ruler, the ruling, gets done by the mind. He says, the vice-gerent mind. This word vice, we have at the beginning of uh, vice-president, vice-chancellor, uh, <coughs> vice-chairman. He's the person who stands in for the real one. No? Yeah. And here he says, the mind is a vice-gerent this is a very unusual word in English, and it comes from a French word, gérer, meaning to manage or organize things. So that's what the mind does. And it's acting as a deputy of the soul. The soul just allows the mind, which is formed in nature, uh, to do that work of managing and organizing in its place. The the master is the purusha, perhaps we can say, the conscious being. Mm. So that leaves the mind as a seeming king. It's as if the mind is our ruler. Mm. Not really, but in appearances. Um, Joel, you please read about the regent. This floating house upon the sea of time the regent sits at work and never rests. He is a puppet of the dance of time. He is driven by the hours. 
the moment's call compelled him with the thronging of life's need and the babble of the voices of the world. Mm, yes. So here he is, the mind, in his floating house on the sea of time. <coughs> here the sea is not life but time. And in that house sits the mind, the regent, the one who's ruling uh, while the king doesn't rule for whatever reason. And he's very diligent. He sits at work and he never rests. But this mind which never rests is just a puppet of the dance of time. In time, there are many forces dancing. And um, if something is a puppet, a puppet is controlled by somebody else. No? Uh, there are different types of puppets. There are puppets that you put your hand in and then you can make it do things. And there are other kinds of puppets that you do with strings. Yeah? And there are wonderful puppeteers who can do such wonderful things with their puppets. Uh, so this mind of ours, we think that it's the ruler, but actually it's just a puppet. It's being controlled by all these things that are moving in the dance of time. This mind, he, now he starts to call it he. He, the regent, he is driven by the hours. Time is always driving him. You must have noticed this. There's always something needs to be done. And there's, at every moment there's calls coming, do this, do that, do the other thing. So all this is driving the mind, compelling the mind. Whether it wants or it doesn't want, it has to do what it's told to do by all these movements of time. Hmm? The thronging of life's need. A throng is a crowd, many things. So life is full of needs like a crowd of people and they're always pushing you and saying, do this, do that, do the other thing. You can really see it happening. Life's need, you say, yes, I have to, I have to. <laughs> and the babel of the voices of the world. There are two different words in English. There's babel and there's babel. Babbling is what babies do. When they're beginning to speak, they, they make nice sounds and uh, they try to make words, babbling. And we speak about water babbling, it's making a, a nice sound. Um, Babel, I don't know whether it's connected, it may be connected in its root. Babel makes us think about the story in the, in the Bible, about the Tower of Babel, which may have been the ancient city of Babylon. Hmm? And the Bible story says that uh, the people all came together. They wanted to build a house that would reach up to God. They wanted to build a, a tall tower. And apparently at that time the gods thought it's not time for them to build, to reach that divine state. So they made them all speak different languages. They couldn't understand each other anymore. They kept speaking and they kept speaking, but they couldn't understand anymore. So they couldn't build their tower. So it's, uh, it's been painted by so many artists, this huge tower and all these millions of people <coughs> swarming, thronging all over it like ants and not understanding each other. So the babel of the voices of the world, all those different calls and orders and commands, they are keeping the mind always active. You like to read, Uma? Hmm? This mind knows silence, knows more dreamlessly in the incessant circling of the steps. <coughs> Through, through. Through the 
listening brain. It starts like a machine and cannot stop. Mm, so this is saying the same thing, no? This mind that we have, it doesn't know what silence is really. And whatever we may think, it doesn't know what dreamer's sleep is either. When we wake up, we may not be aware, but all through the night, our mind has been working. It goes round and round in circles without stopping, incessant. It means it doesn't stop. Thoughts tread forever through the listening brain. Some people think that the brain generates the thought, but it's not like that. The thoughts are passing through the brain. The brain's just picking them up. The mind toils, it works hard, just like a machine, always going on working, and it cannot stop. So who's next, Mahalingam? Into the body's many story rooms, endless crowd down the dream, God, dream gods who say to all is a hundred tone murmur and a bad and step. There is a tireless running to and fro, a haste of movement and a ceaseless cry. Yes. <coughs> so this activity of the brain, of the mind, it um it comes down into the body, the messages from this dream God, this uh, mind consciousness. Uh, the messages are always coming down. We are not aware of it, but now the biologists tell us that whatever it is, whatever movement comes into your mind, it affects the cells of your body. Hmm? Hmm? So these messages always coming down and everything then in the body there's uh, messages going f to and fro everywhere. Uh, a murmur with many tones no? and a babble, here's that's the other word, the babel and the babble and a stir, a movement, tireless running to and fro these messengers and messages. <coughs> hmm? and, uh, it's moving quickly, a haste of movement. And again, this word ceaseless, unending cry, sound is going there. And uh, if we begin to quieten the mind, then we can notice all that happening in the body. Hmm? Uh, Sergei? How is the senses answer the face to upon the outer doors, bring in times visitors the report which call, admit the thousand queries and the calls, and the messages of communicating minds, and the heavy business of unnumbered lives, and all the thousand fold commerce from the world. Yes, and so here he tells us that the, the senses are the servants of this mind. They are running about in this house. No? And they answer quickly, apace. It's an old-fashioned word meaning quickly. Hmm? To every knock upon the outer doors. All these sounds that we hear, things that we feel, the, the wind, all these things are attracting the, uh, their messages and uh, the the senses carry those messages around. No? They answer to every knock upon the outer doors. And they bring in time's visitors, all these many things that are demanding our attention. And every call, I get a lot of calls too, but Dana Lakshmi tries to protect me that I don't have to answer all of them. But these uh, such diligent service servants, they report each call. Hmm? And they let in, they admit, they allow all these many queries, questions uh, to, to come in 
and the calls and the messages from other minds come in. Also there we are not so aware that they're coming in from outside but they are. All this heavy business of unnumbered lives. We feel somehow protected inside our skin. We don't notice how much we are being affected by all the lives around us and not only just in our immediate neighborhood the lives all around the world, the unnumbered lives and all the thousandfold commerce of the world. Commerce is business, exchange. No? It's that so um, multiple. All this is being carried in. I think we have to stop there. Well, one more sentence. Uh, Bhuvana, you'll read. Hmm? Even in the depths of sleep, he can't repose. He moves life steps in strange subconscious dreams. He strays in a subtle realm of symbol scene. His mind with thin air, visions and thin form. He pants or pupils with slight drifting shape, and only a moment spends in silent self. Mm -hmm. So this he, again, this is the mind, no? He, he doesn't, he hardly rests. <coughs> Scant means not enough or very little, no? So even, even in the tracts, even in the lands of sleep, there's not much rest. The mind is mocking or imitating life or the happenings of life in dreams, strange subconscious dreams that might reflect or be prompted in some way by something that's happened during the day. No? <clears throat> or he finds himself wandering about uh, like in a film. Sometimes it's like that, no? in our dreams we're having some kind of adventure. These may, may be symbolic dreams we haven't really gone anywhere, we're just moving about in our consciousness. But those things that we experience and see, they are symbolizing something. Hmm? So the mind packs his nights, fills them up with these thin air visions, these very uh, insubstantial pictures and things, and dim forms, things forms that are not very clearly seen because they are dark and shadowy. He packs them or he peoples he, uh, as if they are people, as if they are beings, these slight drifting shapes. And in a whole night's sleep of eight or nine hours, only a moment spends in silent self. Mother has told us that one of the reasons why we have to sleep for such a long time, it's just so that the mind can really fall silent for a moment or two and be in contact with its origin. But if we don't have that contact with the origin during our night, we wake up feeling not good at all. We haven't we need to go back to sleep because we haven't had the purpose, the, the function of our sleep. So we'll stop there for today. We go back to line 136. We can read these lines together and hopefully we'll understand them better than when I first read them at the beginning. On a dim ocean of subconscious life, a formless surface consciousness awoke. A stream of thoughts and feelings came and went. 
a foam of memories hardened and became a bright crust of habitual sense and thought, a seat of living personality, and recurrent habits mimicked permanence. Mind, nascent, labored out a mutable form. It built a mobile house on shifting sands, a floating isle upon a bottomless sea. A conscious being was by this labor made. It looked around it on its difficult field in the green, wonderful and perilous earth. It hoped in a brief body to survive, relying on matter's false eternity. It felt a Godhead in its fragile house. It saw blue heavens, dreamed immortality. A conscious soul in the inconscious world, hidden behind our thoughts and hopes and dreams, an indifferent master signing nature's acts, leaves the vicegerent mind a seeming king. In his floating house upon the sea of time, the regent sits at work and never rests. He is a puppet of the dance of time, he is driven by the hours, the moment's call compels him with the thronging of life's need and the babel of the voices of the world. This mind no silence knows, nor dreamless sleep. In the incessant circling of its steps, Thoughts tread forever through the listening brain. It toils like a machine and cannot stop. Into the body's many storied rooms, endless crowd down the dream god's messages. All is a hundred-toned murmur and babble and stir. There is a tireless running to and fro, a haste of movement and a ceaseless cry. The hurried servant senses answer apace to every knock upon the outer doors. Bring in time's visitors, report each call, Admit the thousand queries and the calls and the messages of communicating minds and the heavy business of unnumbered lives and all the thousandfold commerce of the world. Even in the tracts of sleep is scant repose. He mocks life's steps in strange subconscious dreams. He strays in a subtle realm of symbol scenes. His night with thin air visions and dim forms he packs or peoples with slight drifting shapes. And only a moment spends in silent self.